I just want to say thank you to Pastor and the youth elders for giving me this opportunity. Um, I am so honored and humbled for this. If I say something wrong, please correct me. Um, before I start, I would like to pray. Um, so let's just close our eyes for a second. Hey, Father God, we thank you for everything, Lord Father. Father, I pray that you uh, open our eyes, God, that we're able to see what you're trying to show us from your word, God. Um, God, that you open our ears, that we're, we're able to hear your voice, God, and you open our hearts, God, that we're able to receive your word. Um, Lord, Father, I pray that any fear that I have, God, any uh, pride that I have, Father, I pray that you take it away right now, Lord, and you fill me with your peace, you fill me with your confidence and your boldness, my God. Holy Spirit, I ask, God, that you, um, that you use me for your glory, that I'm only sharing what you want me to share, God. Um, let your name be glorified in all of this, Father. We give you everything, God. We love you so much, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. So the title of my message um, is, Who Do You Say That I Am? But before I start, um, I would like, uh, before, uh, but to understand why Jesus asked that question, we need to first look at the verses before uh, verse 29. So we need to go all the way to verse 1. Before we read this passage, let us take off our Sunday school hats and read this passage like this is the first time um, reading it. And let's be in awe on how awesome our Jesus is. So verse 1. In those days when again a great crowd had gathered and they had nothing to eat, he called his disciples to him and said to him, I have compassion on the crowd because they have been with me now three days and have nothing to eat. And if I send them away, hungry to their homes, they will faint on the way. And some of them have come far away. And his disciples answered him, How can one feed these people uh, with bread here in this desolate place? And he asked them, How many loaves do you have? And they said, Seven. And he directed the crowd to sit down on the ground. And he took the seven loaves, and given th having given thanks, he broke them and gave them to his disciples to set before the people, and they set them before the crowd. And they had a small few, uh, few small fish, and having blessed them, he said that these also should be set before them. And they ate, and they were satisfied. And they took up the broken piece, pieces left over, seven baskets full, and there were about 4,000 people, and he sent them away. <clears throat> so the first thing we notice is the crowd. So they have been with Jesus for three days now. They're in a desolate place where there's nothing to eat or drink, but they don't care. You see how desperate and hungry they are to, to hear from Jesus and learn from Jesus. In verse 1, when it says, again, a great crowd had gathered, Mark uh, here is referring to the passage of the 5,000 in Mark chapter 6, verse 30 to 44. You see that same desperation and hunger from that crowd. They are running on foot from all the towns. When Jesus sees them, he has compassion on them because they were like sheep without a shepherd. Out of his compassion, he begins to teach them many things. <clears throat> when we look at this story, there's 4,000 people and there's only seven loaves of bread. And a few small fish. There is no way 4,000 people to, are, are able to get fed with seven loaves of bread. Even if they do it Lord's Table style, where everyone takes a tiny portion, they won't be full. But in the scriptures, we see that it is said that they were full and satisfied, and they were, uh, there were seven baskets of bread as leftover. For the 5,000 story, it was the same thing. They were all full and satisfied, and 12 baskets were left over. So when we look at verse 11 through 13, you see Pharisees coming to argue with Jesus. Pharisees are these religious leaders in that time. They know the Old Testament from front to back. I'm sure they probably memorized the verses in original Hebrew language, and yet they completely missed it. They were seeking a sign from heaven, not because they wanted to be uh, prove wrong, but because they didn't believe Jesus was the Messiah. They were so hard-hearted and stubborn in their ways. For the lack of time, I won't be reading John chapter 5, verse 31 to 40, but we will be putting that up uh, for you guys to see at home. 
So in this passage, you see four people and things bearing witness to Jesus being the Messiah. You see Jesus, or you see John the Baptist bearing witness. You see Jesus' own works. His works included uh, miracles, healing, forgiving sins, teaching, and then at, at the end, dying on the cross for our sins. You see, G, uh, you see God the Father bearing witness about his son. And last, you see the scriptures bearing witness about Jesus. Pharisees who read the scriptures every single day of their lives, who memorized the Old Testament in Hebrew, who were these religious leaders and teachers completely missed it. Even the scriptures was pointing to Jesus being the Messiah. They didn't see it because they were so stubborn and hard-hearted. If you see in Mark chapter 7, you see Jesus quoting Isaiah in verse 6 saying that this people honor me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. And then when we get to verse 14 to 21, you see the disciples worrying because they forgot to bring seven, uh, seven baskets and they only brought one loaf. Out of the four Gospels, if we look at Mark and we just focus on the first eight chapters, um, we can see and read all the things the disciples saw Jesus doing. They saw him do miracles. They saw him heal people. They saw him teach evil spirits, acknowledge who Jesus was. And as the readers of the text, we can get so frustrated at the disciples. We can start judging and start questioning on how they could forget that the person who multiplied the bread in the first place is standing right next to them. Before we keep getting mad and keep getting, uh, keep growing frustrated at the disciples, we need to ask ourselves one question. What about us? Let's be honest. All it took was one pandemic and a presidential election to make us forget that Jesus is on the throne. We let fear of people, fear of uh, failure, fear of fu uh, future, and fear of the unknown make us completely forget all the things God has done in our lives. The disciples became so tunnel vision because uh, where all they were thinking about was only bringing one loaf. And that's what we do. We think that our pro we think our problem, we think about our problem and we focus so much on it, and we, we also become tunnel vision, that we also forget all the things God has done, all the doors God has opened for us, all the miracles that He has done, and all the prayers that He has answered. We somehow make this problem so big in our mind that we somehow convince ourselves that there is no way God can deliver us from this. You see, Jesus warning, uh, warning, that, warning the disciples to not be like Pharisees was to not have a hardened heart and not ignore the signs that they witnessed. So the 12 baskets uh, for the 5,000, the 7 baskets for the 4,000, what was Jesus trying to make them see and understand? He was trying to show them that he is the promised Messiah. The same God that gave manna and coil in the wilderness is the same God um, is multiplying in bread, multiplying the bread and fishes in this situation. That he is God in flesh. If we look at verse 21, you see Jesus asking this one question to the disciples. You see him asking, do you not yet understand? What does the word yet mean? If I say I haven't eaten yet, what does that mean? It means that at the present, I haven't eaten, but after church is over, I will eat. So when Jesus says, do you not yet understand, he knows that in the present, the disciples don't understand it. But soon they will come to understand who Jesus is. And then when we look at verse 22 to 26, you see the story of a blind man who comes with his friends to Jesus. And his friends are begging Jesus to heal him. The first time he laid his hands on his, on his eyes, he sees people, but they look like trees walking. The second time he lays his hands, uh, you see the blind man can see everything. In verse 27 to verse 29, you see Jesus asking two questions to the disciples. The first question he asks is, who do people say that I am? And the second question is, who do you say that I am? So in John chapter 1, verse 2 and 3, it says that Jesus was in the beginning with the Father, and all things were made through him. So he created the stars, he created the universe, he created the galaxies and the planets. On earth, he did miracles, he did healing, he walked on water, he raised people from the dead, and many more. So why couldn't he heal this blind man on the first time? 
Why was there a two-step process to his healing? Was Jesus running low on his Holy Spirit power? What was it? It's not that he couldn't heal him in the first time, but rather he was trying to show and teach his disciples and even us something. You see, just like the blind man saw people and they looked like trees walking, there were people who saw Jesus as Elijah, John the Baptist, or a prophet. Being compared to Elijah or John the Baptist or a prophet meant that they acknowledged God was with Jesus. We see in John chapter 2, Nicodemus says, No one could do these things that you do unless God is with him. So they were people who believed that he is from God, but he was not God itself. And just like the blind man saw everything clearly and his eyesight was restored, you see Peter declaring that Jesus is Christ. He finally saw Jesus for who he is. That he was not Elijah like the people said or John the Baptist that he was greater than, all, greater than all of them, that he is the Christ, the promised Messiah. So we need to ask this one tiny question. How could a fisherman figure out who Jesus is and not the Pharisees who read and memorized the scriptures? Was he smarter than them? Did he do all, an all-night meeting with the disciples to figure it out? Did he do some detective work um, to get a background check on Jesus? How could he figure it out out of all people and not the religious leaders and teachers? You see, church, it was not Peter who figured it out, but, but uh, figured it out by himself. But God in his grace and mercy opens Peter's eyes. In Matthew chapter 16, verse 17, you, we see the same story. And you see Jesus saying, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Just like God opens Peter's eyes, we need God to open our eyes for, for us to see Jesus for who he is. How desperate and patient we, are we to sit in his presence and have him open our eyes and teach us. You see, Jesus showed compassion to the crowd because they sat with him for three days or ran from all the towns on foot. And out of that same compassion, you see Jesus teaching them many, many things. So if he can teach us, uh, teach them, can he teach us? In Luke chapter 24, we see Jesus opening the, uh, the minds of the disciples to understand the scripture. That everything that was written in the law, in the prophets, and in the Psalms must be fulfilled. Jesus revealed and made them understand that everything was pointing to him. Just like that, God has given us his spirit to make us understand who Jesus really is. To save time, uh, we won't be reading all of 1 Corinthians chapter 2, verse 9 through 13, but we will look at verse 12 and 13. Now we have received not the spirit of the world, but the spirit who is from God, that we might understand the things freely given us by God. And we impart this words not taught by human wisdom, but taught by the spirit interpreting spiritual truths to those who are spiritual. So what have we done to deserve the things freely given us by God? Is it our family name? Is it our status? How much income we get? Is it because we have this job or that job? If it's none of those things, then what is it? You see, in John chapter 15, verse 15, it says, No longer, Jesus says, No longer do I call you servants. For the, for the servant does not know what his master is doing, but I have called you friends. For all that I have heard from my father, I have made known to you. So you see, Jesus loves us so much that he calls us his friends. It's nothing that we did to deserve that. So one question that we need to figure out is, why is it important for us to read the word? And we need to be sanctified in the truth. You see, in John chapter 17, we see Jesus praying to the Father. And not only is he praying for the disciples, but also he's praying for us, the future believers, his sons and daughters. In verse 17, Jesus says, Sanctify them in the truth, that your word is the truth. We need the word to teach us who Jesus really is. Just like Jeremy reminded us a couple days ago, we need to read his word, meditate on the word, and apply it in our lives. Though that this word is living and active, that is sharper than a two-edged sword, 
piercing our hearts and purging out all the evil things that does not bring glory to God. So this process does not happen overnight, it's a, but it's an everyday process. We need his daily bread. That's why Jesus says in, Lord's, in the Lord's Prayer to give us this day our daily bread. Every day we need his word. Just reading for a little bit is not enough. We need to also meditate on it and live it out every day. So let us not minimize scripture in our lives. One of the pastors said this, to minimize scripture in your life is to divorce yourself from knowing, the, knowing Christ. A couple of years ago, Zach um, said this during his exhortation, and it really convicted me. No matter how good of a Christian you are one day, even in that day, we desperately need his grace and his mercy. That we need, we need his word every single day. I know we sometimes struggle to read, uh, sit and read for 15 minutes, but we stay for hours and hours for worship night, for freedom hour, for music night. Worship is good and it's important. And I know in a few minutes we're going to have worship team come up and we're going to sing and praise God. And it's important. But to sing about someone, we need to first know who we're singing about. In closing, in 2 Timothy chapter 4, verse 3 and 4. He says this, For the time is coming when the people will not endure sound teaching, but have itching ears. They will accumulate for themselves teachers to suit their own passions and will turn away from listening to the truth and wander off into myths. For the, for the time is coming. How real is that right now, church? A lot of times we listen to speakers because they are funny, they are high energy, and they're good storytellers. Very few times do we check if they're even speaking the truth or not. Same thing with music. We listen to songs because it's written by a popular church, a popular group, or a popular person. Very rarely do we check if it's backed up by scripture. We need to be like the people in Berea in Acts chapter 17, who received the word with all eagerness but also ex examine the scripture daily to see if Paul and Silas were saying the right things. So when the whole world has a certain view on who Jesus is, Jesus is asking us, his body, his church, this one question. Who do you say that I am? May his name be glorified.